Hi, everyone. I just thought I'd uh, give a quick update about a trial on Meniere's disease that is being currently run in Sydney. I have spoken to many of you um, about this trial informally, but I just have some um, really good information. So I thought I'd um, just record a bit of an update about it. Um, so this trial involves a novel sustained release steroid that's that can be applied intratympanically. Uh, the trial has been conducted and funded by Spiral Therapeutics. Um, uh, just wanted to declare no conflicts of interest. Uh, uh, I'm not receiving any personal remuneration for this study. Spiral Therapeutics is funding the cost of the trial. And the also wanted to acknowledge Dr. Jeffrey Kutubatin from Perth, who is an ENT surgeon um, who has done the first phase of this study, and I really want to thank him for um, donating his um, his data, which I can share with you. I also wanted to acknowledge the other collaborators in the second uh, phase of the study in all of the different states, um, uh, acknowledging Professor Steve O'Leary in Victoria and Dr. Sharon Chowler in South Australia. Um, so as you all know, many years is a chronic condition, um, which, is, which is quite debilitating. And uh, whilst there's no cures, there's also no FDA-approved drugs um, specifically for Meniere's disease. Um, the current guidelines um, include the use of steroids, either oral or intratympanic. The problem with the intratympanic steroids we've had so far is that we're blindly injecting a bit of steroid in the middle ear and hoping that that then gets absorbed into the inner ear. Um, there is very... Um, a little way of certainty when we do this that the drug's actually going to remain in the middle ear for a long enough time. Um, and, and so this trial is really exciting because it helps address some of those barriers that as clinicians we have in this uncertainty. Um, so just a, a bit of a, um, uh, I'll just show share with you a quick video, um, bear with me. So this is a video about the trial, um, uh, about the um, about the drug and also the delivery mechanism of the drug. Um, so as we know, this is a this is a model of the ear canal with the eardrum and um, the the middle ear space. The middle ear through the middle ear space, we can usually visualize the round window membrane, uh, which is the entry to the uh, the cochlea. Uh, the drug is uh, the drug delivery mechanism is also unique in that it has an endoscope and a little um, a needle uh, which um, uh, delivers the drug attached to it. So after numbing the ear canal with the tiny little slit made in the eardrum, about as small as the insertion for grommet, uh, the drug is delivered under visualization into the round window. Uh, the drug then solidifies a little bit like into a gel formulation. And the idea is that the steroids can be released slowly over a period of three months into the inner ear, which is really um, you know, a game changer. Um, this is a clinical video um, uh, of one of Dr. Kutubudin's cases showing the endoscope going through the little uh, slit into uh, the middle ear. This is the round window. And it's a great visualization of the round windows precisely um, to show there's the scarring or adhesions that will obstruct the absorption of the inner ear, uh, uh, absorption of the drug into the inner ear. And um, here's the drug being injected. And you can only, you only have to inject a very, very tiny amount of drug so the drug then doesn't fill up the rest of the middle ear space and that's how we can be sure that it doesn't cause conductive hearing loss um, the slit obviously then uh, seals up um, uh, the slit in the eardrum slit seals up and the um, tympanic membrane will just um, close over um, so this is just a few results. The first phase of the study was to look at the safety and tolerability of the study. So apart from uh, um, del delivering the drug, uh, there were also um, MRI scans done and blood tests done, uh, which demonstrated that the drug was present in the ear for a prolonged period of time 
and also in the bloodstream uh, for a prolonged period of time. Um, the, um, there were about 10 patients uh, enrolled in this study um, and they were followed up um, uh, for uh, quite some time. Um, and overall, there was no adverse effects um, uh, reported, um, no significant adverse uh, effects reported about the study. And the results were actually quite good uh, in demonstrating significant reduction of vertigo over the trial period. So based on that, this current phase of the study is now a, a multi-center study, but it's also randomized. The last cohort was not randomized. They all got the drug, but now the patients are going to be put into two groups and blinded. So the patients won't know whether they've had the drug or they've had um, a placebo. Um, so um, the uh, it involves um, so recruiting patients who have a definite Meniere's disease um, in one year, and they've had definite attacks of uh, attack of vertigo at least um, for twenty minutes in the three month three months prior to screening. Once they enroll, they have to have two attacks of vertigo in that um, uh, 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 to demonstrate that they have active disease before they can get the uh, drug. Um, if the patient is in the placebo group, um, after about 85 days, they have the option of changing over to get the drug. Um, and the key, key exclusion criteria, and there's a patients who have chronic ear disease, which will interfere with the drug absorption um, and effectiveness, and also any other sinus disease um, that can spread to the, uh, the middle ear, um, any other um, issues with the tympanic membrane or active other active vestibular problems. So if they have active vestibular migraine or superior canal dehiscence or um, BPPV. Um, so what does it involve? Um, as I said, um, it involves a sin single intratympanic injection. The patients are going to be randomized either through the drug group or the placebo group. Um, placebo patients can cross over at about 85, um, uh, day 85. Um, there will be 10 visits required. There's no cost to the patient, but patients do get reimbursed per visit. Um, if you'd like more information about it, of course, please feel free to contact me, but um, you can also contact uh, James McQuillan, who is our clinical trials coordinator at the Sydney Adventist Hospital. At this stage, the Sydney Adventist Hospital is the only clinical site um, that's gone through the uh, governance. Um, I'm hoping as the um, uh, trial uh, picks up, perhaps there will be other sites, um, but um, yeah, please feel free to contact me and um, uh, hopefully... Um, this is something that interests you and if it can help you, um, I'd be very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much.